Good morning. It's great to be with you again. Maybe not in person this time, but it's lovely to be able to share God's word with you this morning. So shall we begin by praying together? Father God, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you that in it we see the Lord Jesus Christ revealed. And we pray, Lord, that as we look at this passage this morning, that you would stir our hearts afresh and draw us ever closer to Jesus. And we ask this in his name. Amen. This is a guy called James Howells. He's an IT guy. And he was in the news recently because of something he chucked in the bin. Back in 2013, he decided to have a bit of a clear out and found an old computer hard drive in a desk drawer. He threw it away into the household waste. It was trash, something to be disposed of, right? Well, no. At some point later, he realised to his horror what had been on the disk. Seven and a half thousand bitcoins, the virtual currency, valued today at around 220 million quid. Not trash, but treasure, something of extraordinary value. And we'll come back to James later. Two very different values put on the same object, worth nothing, trash, worth an extraordinary amount, treasure. And in some ways, we see something a bit similar in today's passage, two very different values being put, not on an object this time, but on a person, Jesus. One group of people wanting to get rid of him and one person treasuring him above all else. And in the end, when it comes to Jesus, all of us are going to do one of those two things. Today, we're going to be continuing in the series, The Road to Calvary, taking a fresh look at Jesus and his death on the cross. As Nick said on the first Sunday of this series, this is of greatest importance because obviously of who Jesus is. And Bob reminded you last week of Jesus coming into Jerusalem in triumph as king, but of this dividing people because there were some who didn't want Jesus to be their king. And our reading today is set both in Jerusalem and just outside of it. And the festival that's going to be the backdrop of all that happens is just around the corner. Jesus has traveled south from Galilee because he's doing what most Jewish men would be doing, coming to Jerusalem for the festival of Passover. Now, the tradition was that the meal had to be eaten within the walls of Jerusalem, and that's where Jesus will share the Passover. But for this evening, he's with friends at Bethany. So let's have a look at the reading. And if you've got a Bible, it would be great if you could have it open at Mark chapter 14 and verses 1 to 11. Now, the reading in Mark is a bit like a sandwich. There's the main bit, the good stuff, and, and that's in the middle. But there's something else on either side of it that we need to see too. But we're going to start with the best bit in the middle. Now, let's get our bearings first. When Jesus went into Jerusalem on the donkey, he went from Bethany and Bethphage. And it seems that Jesus used Bethany as his base for this week maybe staying there most nights and walking into Jerusalem each day, uh, a walk of maybe 30 to 40 minutes. Now, Jesus has stayed in Bethany at least twice before at the home of two sisters, Mary and Martha, and their brother Lazarus. And he stayed with them just a few weeks before when, as you were reminded last week, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead an astounding event which has resulted in many people putting their faith in Jesus. We also read about this event in uh, Matthew's Gospel, but also John's Gospel. And it's in John that we discover that Mary, Martha and Lazarus are all at this meal. Uh, it, but it's not being held at their house this time. It's at the house of a friend uh, or a neighbour, Simon the leper. Or we should probably call him Simon the ex-leper, because if he was still a leper, 
they wouldn't have been able to be a, a gathering like that in his house. And we're told in John that the meal was being held in Jesus's honour. He'd raised Lazarus from the dead and most probably he'd healed Simon of his skin disease. Can you imagine having the actual Messiah, God's chosen and long awaited king, actually coming to your house for a meal? What a privilege. And I wonder if you can imagine the scene. Both Simon and Lazarus are reclining at the table, as are Jesus's disciples and maybe others as well. The atmosphere is fantastic. There's laughter and joy. And of course, at the center of it all is Jesus. Martha and others serve at the table with delight. Then it's John's gospel that tells us that the woman who came with the jar was actually Mary. And she approaches Jesus with an alabaster jar in her hand. Martha looks at her sister puzzled, then light dawns and she stops what she's doing and looks on in wonder. And the conversation gradually dies away as every eye is drawn to Mary as she kneels beside Jesus's feet as he reclines at the table. She then snaps the thin neck of the jar and begins to pour the perfume on Jesus's head and the powerful and beautiful fragrance of nard begins to fill the room. She then pours it on Jesus' feet, wiping his feet with her uncovered hair, her face shining with love and joy. And by now the whole house is filled with the heady scent of nard. Jesus watches in silence, his eyes fixed on her, a serene smile on his lips. But as she empties the whole jar upon Jesus, the muttering begins. What a waste, says one of the guests in a rather loud whisper. Heads nod around the table. Then Judas pipes up. It could have been sold for a year's wages and the money given to the poor, murmurs of agreement. And the harsh and the accusing words continue and the expression on Mary's face becomes one of pain and con confusion. Then Jesus turns his head away from Mary and towards them, and his words cut through the clamour. Leave her alone, says Jesus. Why are you bothering her? He doesn't wait for an answer. She has done a beautiful thing to me. Now, in what ways is it beautiful? Well, here's three possible reasons. Firstly, it shows just how much Mary values Jesus. She pours out upon him what is probably her most costly possession and the word waste never enters her head. No, Jesus is worth every drop because Jesus is her greatest treasure. She would, I'm sure, have echoed her sister's words in John 11, that Jesus was indeed not just the Messiah, but the Son of God. She had sat at his feet and listened to his words. She had witnessed him calling her brother back from beyond the dead with just three powerful words. There was no one alive more precious to her than Jesus. And this was beautiful because it was her showing her love for him. But I think also it was beautiful because it dovetailed perfectly with God's purposes. Look at what Jesus says in verse eight. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. What she did was more appropriate than she probably ever realized. It was anointing Jesus' body for the burial that lay beyond the cross. Mary may not have realised what lay ahead, but Jesus knew exactly what was coming. Mary's act, following her heart and the Spirit's leading, did something that had significance beyond anything that she could imagine and dovetailed beautifully with God's eternal purposes for salvation. But also, it was beautiful 
because her shocking extravagance, her pouring out this costly treasure in love, mirrored in a small way what Jesus was about to do on the cross and mirrored his own heart. Jesus, as he hung on the cross, was pouring out his unimaginably valuable blood in an act of infinite self-giving love. And Mary's act mirrored that in a small way. She has done a beautiful thing to me, says Jesus, just before he is about to do the most beautiful thing for us. She has done a beautiful thing. But there's also a very different evaluation of Jesus in these verses, a very different calculation of his worth. In verses one and two, we see that the leaders want to dispose of Jesus. It says that uh, they were looking for some sly way to arrest Jesus and kill him. They see Jesus as a threat to their power, their status and their popularity. As early as chapter three in Mark's gospel, they've been plotting to kill him. He's been openly critical, you see, of their abuse of God's word, of their lack of care and compassion for God's people and of their rejection of him and therefore of God himself. And Judas goes over to their side. Scripture makes no comment on what's going on in his heart, except in John's account of the story, he tells us that he's a thief who had no real care for the poor, taking money instead for himself. Had he only ever been in it for himself and what he could get from Jesus? We'll never know exactly what was going on in his heart and mind, but he does come to the opposite valuation of Jesus to Mary. Instead of a beautiful thing, he does a despicable thing. Instead of valuing Jesus above all else, he's prepared to trade him in for money for himself and take the side of those who, instead of treasuring Jesus, saw him as trash to be disposed of. But as I said at the beginning, in the end, those two valuations of Jesus are the only two possible places that we end up. You see, Jesus can never be moderately important, just a, a useful addition to our lives. If he's just an addition to our lives, then he isn't king of our lives. He's either going to be the person we treasure the most, or he's going to be somebody that we count as trash because we'd rather that he wasn't there. We'd rather he quietly disappeared. And of course, there's two very different outcomes for Mary and Judas. Mary is remembered and praised. And in fact, we're fulfilling Jesus's words today when he says that wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. And we're fulfilling those words today, remembering her beautiful act. Judas, on the other hand, is forever remembered as a traitor. And just a few verses on in Mark's gospel, Jesus says some of the most chilling words in scripture. He says, woe to the man who betrays the son of man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Verse 21. Jesus will divide people. It's always been that way and it's still that way today. But just two questions for us to think about as we finish this morning. Firstly, is Jesus becoming more precious to us? I guess the reality is that because we live in a fallen world and because of the ongoing battle in our hearts with sin, our hearts can blow hot and cold at different times and our love for Jesus with it. But praise God, we have the Holy Spirit within and he will always be wanting to show us more of Jesus. In the last few months, I've been hugely blessed by a couple of books, one called Gentle and Lowly 
and one called An Ocean of Grace, although I've only just started reading the second one. And both books draw on the writing of saints of old to point the reader to the heart of Jesus. This is what one of them says in the introduction. These people speak with a different voice. The language which can sometimes sound strange to our ears has for that very reason the power to speak the truth to us with fresh vigour. Phrases we have heard a hundred times are replaced by new expressions that renew our thinking and engage our imaginations. It's one way engaging with these sorts of books of stirring up a fresh love for Jesus. And wherever we're at in the Christian life, wherever our heart is at the moment, let's take time leading up to this time leading up to Easter to draw near to Jesus afresh as we draw near to the cross. Because to do what Mary did, to love Jesus as Mary did, we need to know Jesus as Mary did. She had sat at Jesus' feet, listening to his words. She had an awareness of the enormity of what Jesus had done for her, even before he died on the cross. And we have a treasure trove, both in the word of God itself and also in the words of believers who have gone before us to stir up afresh our love for Jesus and therefore how much we treasure him. But secondly, maybe it's good to remember that reckless extravagance should from time to time be part of our Christian life because that's the heart of Jesus. And maybe the Holy Spirit is prompting us to do something extravagant today. It might be something to do with our time, our money, our possessions, our career, our home. Others may see it as a waste. And in the world's eyes, a lot that we do should seem strange or inexplicable. But when it's done for Jesus, even if the world thinks it, it's bonkers, Jesus will see it as beautiful. I said that we'd come back to James, our IT guy with the lost hard drive. He was asked in a BBC interview at the council landfill site where the drive ended up. How do you feel stood here? He replied, absolutely devastated. I just wish I could go back in time and not throw that drive away. Sadly, it will be unimaginably worse as it was for Judas, for those who see Jesus, who treat him as trash. But I really hope, and I've prayed, that James finds Jesus because if he does, then he can realise that what is lost, even £220 million, is nothing compared to what he can have in Jesus. Mary knew that, and so can we. I'm going to finish by just reading part of one of these prayers from An Ocean of Grace that focuses on the Lord Jesus and his word, his worth. Let's pray, shall we? Lord Jesus Christ, you are the centre of heaven's happiness, the wellspring that fills saints and angels. There is as much happiness in you as happiness exists. Whatever excellency is in heaven is in you. Whatever belongs to glory is found in you. You are all good things to all your saints in heaven. Beauty to their eyes, music to their ears, honey to their mouths, perfume to their nostrils, health to their bodies, joy to their souls, light to their understanding, content to their wills. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would draw us closer to yourself, that what the saints taste in heaven, we would taste more of here on earth, that we would once again taste and see that the Lord is good. And we ask this in your name. Amen.